Hi, in this recording, I will present our 2021 review of finance article titled An Augmented Q Factor Model with Expected Growth. This is joint paper with Ko Wei Ho, Hai Tao Mo, and Chen Xue. In this article, we augment our Q factor model with an expected growth factor to form the Q5 model. In the Q factor model, we have four factors, market factor, the size factor, the investment factor, and the ROE factor, in which ROE stands for return on equity. And in this paper, we're gonna augment the Q factor model with the new factor, uh, which is the expected growth factor. We then conduct a large scale empirical horse race with a large set of 150 significant anomalies, um, which we compile in our prior work on replicating anomalies. And we show that the Q5 model improves substantially on the Q factor model in accounting for this set of significant anomalies. And in addition, the Q factor model already compares reasonably well with the Pharma French six factor model. So um, the outline for the presentation, I will first discuss the economics behind the expected growth factor. And then I will describe the empirical construction of the new factor. And the third, I'm gonna present um, um, the evidence on stress testing factor models. This is a large scale empirical horse race. And then finally, I'm gonna highlight a few prominent examples of individual anomalies and how the Q5 model is able to account for them. So in terms of theory, so let me, let me just give a two period example. The paper actually has a multi-period and I'm just gonna hit the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the high level intuition. So three defining features of newer classical economics, rational expectations, consumers maximize utility, and firms maximize the market value of equity. Finally, markets clear. On the demand side of for risky assets, so we're gonna stick with the representative household. So two period utility, this is utility today and expected utility for a next period consumption and the fairly standard budget constraints, which I will skip the details. So this is all textbook uh, treatment. And then you put everything together, you're gonna have the fundamental equation of asset pricing, uh, which is a reformulation of the consumption Euler equation, which says conditional expectation of pricing kernel times stock return or any risky return for that matter, uh, gotta be equal to one. And the pricing kernel or stochastic discount factor is, the, in, is given by the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution. And using the definition of covariance, you can re rewrite this equation as expected risk premium equals beta times lambda in which beta is the consumption betas, all right? So lambda is the price of consumption risk. So I should mention that this model and the basic uh, pricing framework applies more broadly. It doesn't have to be um, the representative households SDF and could be the financial intermediary, for example, or any uh, marginal investor uh, for a specific risky asset for that matter. So, so this is the overall demand side uh, based asset pricing. So we're gonna be doing something different, which is, uh, which is from the supply side. So we call this framework the investment cap -in, which is a reformulation of the uh, well-established net present value rule in corporate finance. Um, so here's a simple example. An individual firm maximizes the market value of equity. On the left-hand side, you have uh, X dividend firm value, D stands for dividend. Uh, the firm is gonna choose optimal investment investment policy optimally such that uh, the market value of equity is maximized. Okay, On the in the objective function, uh, pi stands for um, profitability or return on assets, for example, and A stands for productive capital or productive assets. So pi times A would be operating cash flow or operating profits. Um, and then you, you subtract capex, I stands for investment, and then you need to take away some investment related expenses. So we're gonna be following the, um, 
the newer classical Q theory of investment using the simplest model possible, which is quadratic adjustment cost. So the first three terms on the right hand side are going to amount to dividends, right? So that's free cash flow. Uh, we're going to assume firms distribute free cash flows back to shareholders. Um, it's simplest possible payout policy. So um, after the firm do the investment, uh, this period at the beginning of next period, you're going to have productive assets stated T plus one. Uh, firm can use uh, the productive assets is produced to generate operating cash flow again, pi times A, T plus one. Uh, the firm is going to distribute all the cash flow back to shareholders um, because there are only two periods. There's no investment in the next period. All right. So the first principle of investment, you can write down the optimality condition and then under constant return to scale. So you can write down stock return as a function of pure firm level variables, right? So, and this piece is the standard definition of stock return. And then, um, and, uh, and the, the, um, the right hand side of this equation uh, is gonna be from uh, the first principle of real investment. In particular, the denominator is marginal cost of investment and which is in turn equals marginal Q and uh, under constant return to scale, it's just Tobin's Q, right? So we call this, uh, this equation the investment cap M. Uh, in particular, if you take expectation on both sides, you're going to have expect return equals expected profitability divided by marginal cost of investment. And we call this feature cross-sectionally varying expect returns. Okay. So in general equilibrium, the, the buy side and the sell side, right? Supply and demand. Uh, have to equilibrate and jointly determine uh, expected return. And in general equilibrium, both consumption cap and or, or intermediary cap or whatever marginal investor based cap M is going to be equal to the expected return derived from the investment cap and derived from the supply side. Okay. So from the consumption or from the demand side, we see that risks are characteristics of expected returns, for, but the on the other hand, from the uh, supply side, you can see all the right hand side the variables are firm level specific variables. Firm level accounting variables or characteristics are sufficient statistics of expected return, right? If you read the body can markers, the investments textbook uh, that I've been using for uh, 20 years in teaching MBA students, for example, risks. It says that, you know, using the under the um, sharp linear capital asset pricing model, uh, we always say beta, market beta is sufficient to determining, to, to determine expected return. In other words, risks are sufficient statistics for expected returns. But that's only a feature from the demand side, okay? From the supply side, it, it is characteristics that are sufficient statistics of expected returns. It's not from the supply side, it's not that the demand side doesn't matter. It does matter, but the impact of consumption beta is already embedded in the uh, firm level uh, uh, variables, okay? They're already embedded uh, in the investment policy and as a result, endogenously determine the profitability, okay? So in other words, both covariances and characteristics, they both matter. Okay, and they are both sufficient. Empirically, is a matter of which side is better measured. I'm gonna say it is the supply side of variables that are better measured than the demand side um, covariances. And this is a uh, uh, this this is our philosophical stand of doing asset pricing, uh, which is a fundamental departure uh, from traditional uh, capital asset pricing model, the cap M and consumption cap M. Um, uh, right, so this is basically our 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 new our new approach. Relatively speaking, new approach is to is to turn the supply side. This is trend based on the supply side. We're going to turn the corporate finance uh, equation around and use that as a, as a pricing theory. All right, so the way we implement in the Q factor model, we're going to implement this equation, the investment cap M, using a factor approach. Uh, we ended up using a um, four factor based Q factor model. We use market factor as an anchor for, um, for average return. Okay, and we're gonna, um, in the time series, average return, we're gonna use investment factor and ROE factor to, to, to exp explain the cross sectional dispersion 
Okay. So in average return or in expected returns. Okay. So, and we throw size factor in there because in our factor construction of investment ROE factor, we control for size. Okay. So if we do not include the size as explained in our 2015 RFS paper, the model is going to screw up the size um, that's our size premium. So we put size in there because again, um, we control for size in constructing investment ROE factor. It's natural to throw size in here. And in a more general model with decreasing return to scale, for example, um, then there's no analytical uh, relation. You have to solve the model numerically as what I did in my 2005 journal finance article. And you can actually motivate the size factor. And all our Q factors data and uh, uh, more than 150 uh, testing portfolios on anomalies are posted on our data library and globalq.org. So the, the basic intuition or economic mechanism behind the Q factor model is really um, based on the two period model. It says that oil is being equal high investment stocks should earn lower cost of capital should have be associated with lower cost of capital and earn lower rates of returns um now x and all right and then low investment stocks so uh profitability factor says that oil is being equal high expected profitability relative to uh, investment should should imply high cost of capital and should earn higher rates of returns on average going forward So basically investment factor and ROE, ROE factor are basically restatement of the well-established net present value rule in corporate finance. And of course, in corporate finance, oftentimes um, the model corporate finance theory works with risk neutrality. So it's largely silent about that surprising, uh, but, uh, but it's actually straightforward. Uh, technically, at least, uh, to do the extension to asset pricing, but conceptually, philosophically, and this is the big departure vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the, the consumption cap uh, framework. All right, so in this paper, we're going to introduce an expected growth uh, because for the in the two in the Q factor model, we we only worked with the static model that lasts for only two periods. The static model says that expect return equals expected profitability divided by marginal costs of investment. And in a multi-period model, it turns out if you, there's an extra piece, which is the continuation value for extra unit of capital, net of depreciation uh, next period, okay? The, uh, the intuition is that firms pay the marginal cost of investment today, okay? At the beginning of the next period, you're going to have one extra unit of capital. You use that extra unit of capital to produce operating profits. And that's given by the marginal product of capital, uh, which is return on assets, right? But at the end of that period, the net of delta, which is the rate of depreciation, you're going to have some leftover capital. And that leftover capital is going to be worth marginal Q, which is in turn equals marginal cost of investment next period. So this one plus a i over a t plus one piece. This piece is the marginal cost of investment next period, which is going to be exactly the marginal benefit, the marginal q, the shadow value, the market value uh, of that extra unit of capital. In other words, it's the present value of all future cash flows that can be generated by that extra leftover capital. Okay, and that's exactly, so uh, gonna be worth marginal Q. So again, in a lot of accounting-based models, um, um, so researchers work with the present value of infinite sum, right? So um, the residual income model and all, in the investment model, in the investment cap M, you can replace marginal Q, which is the present value of infinite sum of future dividends uh, with, the, with the marginal cost of investment, which is only a function of your investment rate today. So and this is a this is a, this 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 uh, linkage writes on the first principle of investment. And we always say investment is forward looking, and this is exactly why. Okay, and this is why. All right. So the 
So, so this multi-period return, you see that uh, there are two components, just like the regular definition of stock return. You have dividend yield component, which is pi over marginal cost of investment. And this is basically what we build on to, 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 to generate um, the Q factor model. And in this paper, we're going to take a, take a crack at the, the quote unquote capital gain component, which is roughly uh, the, the growth rate of investment of assets. Okay, so this is I over A next period relative to investment rate today. Okay, so what what is the intuition? Why it's how is expected growth related to expected return? Well, uh, to go there, it may be helpful to recall our intuition behind the economic mechanism behind the profitability factor, uh, which is right now pretty well known in the profession, both in academia and in industry. So. We were saying, look, high profitability, high expected profitability, okay, relative to low investment today must imply high cost of capital. So that high cost of capital is gonna offset, it's gonna offset, counteract against high expected profitability so that my denominator is relatively low, right? So the net present value rule is gonna imply this nonlinear relation among these three variables in a static model. So, and that's the basic intuition. So in other words, high expected profitability next period means that my marginal benefit of investment today is expectedly, um, my expected marginal benefit of investment today is high. For me to induce me to keep my investment low in order to take advantage of that expected benefit, it must be my cost of capital today is high such that I don't invest a whole lot today, right? And that's the economic mechanism behind the uh, profitability factor. The analogous mechanism holds for expected investment. Okay, so again, in a uh, while well, the point is that in a multi-period model, profitability is not the only marginal benefit of investment. It turns out the bigger magnitude, in terms of magnitude, the bigger component is the expected investment next period. Right? Again, if my expected investment next period is high, intuitively, it, if the present value of all future cash flows generated by my ex leftover capital is high, all right, so that means my marginal benefit of investment today is high, to prevent me from taking advantage of that high marginal benefit next period, by not investing a whole lot today, it must be my cost of capital is high today. All right, so it's the exact analogous intuition behind the uh, profitability factor, okay? And that's the economic mechanism. Uh, and, that's the, uh, and that's the intuition behind the expected growth factor. Bottom line is that high expected growth um, relative to investment today or relative to uh, valuation ratio today, keep in mind the denominator is marginal Q or marginal cost, which in turn equals marginal Q, which is, mm, average Q under some conditions, which is stock valuation level, right? So bottom line is that high expected growth or else be equal must mean high expected return. Now let's talk about, the, let me head into the um, construction empirically. Uh, the difficulty is gonna arise for the expected growth factor in the following sense. So again, go back to the previous equation. For the ROE factor, it is actually relatively straightforward because in theory, it is that expected profitability is gonna impact on expected return today, right? But we know that profitability in the data is highly persistent. So all we ended up doing is the simplest approach possible, which is, you, which is to use current profitability as a proxy for expected profitability. However, investment at the firm level is not persistent at all, okay? Uh, we provided some evidence in our 2019 Review of Finance article uh, titled, Which Factors? Uh, please see a previous uh, video presentation uh, that we uh, reported the cross-sectional annual regressions of investment rate on lagged investment rate. The R score in the first year is about 5% and drops to zero quickly within, within three, four years. Whereas profitability is highly persistent. Um, the R square remains about 10% even in 10th year. And then in the first year is about, about 55%, right? So 
profitability is persistent. So it is okay to use current profitability as a proxy for expected profitability, but we cannot do that for investment rate. We have to take a stand on the predictors. How do we do the prediction for expected growth? All right, this is what we end up using. A big caveat is that um, expected growth is unobservable. You have to take a stand somehow. And uh, in particular, we ended up using operating cash flows as a predictor. So we, we, we construct our expected growth proxy using um, uh, by, by performing annual cross-sectional forecasting regressions of how year ahead, and most importantly, one year ahead, the investment to assets changes on Tobin skew, operating cash flow, and the changing ROE. The most important predictor is really operating cash flow. Okay, so that we offer some intuition, intuitive discussions in the paper, but the most important um, mechanism channel, in my view, is related to intangibles. Okay, and Penman and Love um, and co-authors have written uh, extensively, especially Baruch Love's um, influential work on intangibles. So uh, uh, basically, the basic um, um, intuition is that, um, look, according to the standard um, accounting um, principles, gap principles, for example, uh, intangible investments such as R&D uh, are expensed away from current earnings, okay? Uh, that you, in other words, your earnings for firms like Pfizer, for example, so the, your current earnings are going to be artificially low because of lots of R&D. Okay, like Amazon, you know, lots of intangible investment, and you're gonna have uh, lots of artificially low earnings, and uh, and uh, and the dead earnings is actually quite misleading. Um, so the R and D, the big chunk of R and D and intangible investment is gonna induce a high expected growth for going forward, but you, it's hard to ascertain that from your low earnings today. Okay, so uh, and that's the mismatch. Uh, between the current accounting, conservative accounting, and the uh, economic construct, okay, economic concept. So, and there's been a lot of debate, it's gigantic literature um, stimulated by uh, Lev's influential work, and Lev argues that, oh, right, you really need to um, uh, put the intangibles uh, on the balance sheet. On the other hand, the Penman and um, uh, many others argue that it's not exactly clear because once you put the intangible uh, capital on the balance sheet, then you will be forced to come up with the uh, amortization and the impairment, the write-off rules for intangibles uh, because, uh, because intangible investment is highly uncertain, which is why accountants are reluctant uh, to put these risky investments on the balance sheet, um, right? And if you uh, take a stand on one size fit all, fits all rule on amortization, for example, and that may contaminate your current uh, quality for current earnings. So, and, uh, and, uh, and the Penman argues that although for Coca-Cola, for example, although the brand capital is not exactly on balance sheet, but uh, you, can, you, can, you can kind of infer, you can ascertain the value creation of that brand capital from Coca-Cola's operating cash flow. The operating cash flow is going to be persistently high than whatever the balance sheet can justify, right? So, um, and eleven co-authors in this paper, they actually build on, they actually come up with the measure of intangible capital, organizational capital, by by looking at um, operating cash flow, right? So, in other words, so um, in our view, the operating cash flow is pretty well motivated from the accounting literature that uh, because operating cash flow uh, captures the impact of intangible investments on expected growth, right? And lots of debates in the literature how exactly to measure intangibles, uh, right? Which fraction of SG&A should be considered as investment, intangible investment, whereas when building a factor model, it's essential that we don't embed a lot of measurement errors in our predictors uh, because it's gonna be a mess going forward. So we ended up using the simplest uh, measure, uh, uh, one of the simple, ma simpler measures possible, which is operating cash flow. It's 
you know, already um, in the income statement, they so, so, so it's straightforward for us to use. But the bottom line is that caveat, uh, as I noted already, our expected growth factor is gonna depend on specification. Okay, in particular, we have to use cash flows. Um, uh, the results are gonna depend on operating cash flow as a predictor. Okay, with that out of the way, so let's look at some key results. So cross-sectional monthly, uh, cross-sectional regressions of future. Right, I misspoke earlier. I said the annual cross-sectional regressions. We are using monthly cross-sectional regressions. Pardon me. So monthly cross-sectional regressions of future one-year head investment asset changes on the instruments log of Tobin's Q and this operating cash flow and changing uh, year-to-year -year quarterly uh, change in quarterly earnings, quarterly ROE. Um, bottom line is that operating cash flow forecasts future growth reliably with the positive sign. And this Pearson and rank correlation, we are correlate the expected growth, expected one-year head investment asset changes with subsequent realized one-year head investment asset changes. Okay, and in constructing the expected growth proxy, we make sure we do not use future information. Okay, we use rolling regressions to, uh, to, 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 to estimate the 10 year, 120 months rolling window to estimate coefficients and then apply the slopes on the reasonably available, reasonably observed uh, instruments. And then we correlate that expected growth pro proxy with subsequent realized uh, growth rates. It turns out that it's even at the firm level. So um, correlation 21% is uh, reasonable. It's not too high, it's not too low either. Uh, we we do better at the portfolio level. So uh, this table, we report the expected growth deciles. So basically after we have the expected growth proxy, uh, we, we sort we saw the stocks into deciles based on this proxy, NYC breakpoints and value wage returns. So high minus low, I expected growth, we get the 1.07% per month and T value is fairly reliable 4.5. And look at the expected one year expected growth. Okay, and that's this piece. So high minus low 22.8 or 0.9, which is fairly close to the subsequent realized average, okay, 22.7. And across the portfolios, the cross-sectional correlation of averaged over time is 64%. So this is um, comforting. Uh, this point estimate is comforting in our view. Uh, but again, we, we remain tentative about the, about the expected growth proxy. So human beings are fallible. So scientific knowledge is fallible. And uh, we remain open. There could be, could be better proxies or to improve things further. And we're all open to that. Right. So then we construct the expected growth factor with independent two by three sorts on market equity and expected growth. So high minus low following exactly Pharma French, uh, 1993 article again, um, instead of HML, instead of book to market, we're sorting on size and expected growth and average high minus average low. Uh, we generate a high factor premium, 84 basis points per month and the T value above 10. So if we regress that on the Q factor model, it leaves behind the 67 basis points per month. Highly reliable, this first regression means that the Q factor model cannot capture the expected growth factor. In other words, the expected growth factor, it's a missing dimension from our Q factor model, which is in turn motivated from a static investment cap M framework, whereas the expected growth is from a multi-period investment cap M framework. The subsequent three regressions, just trying to figure out the, exactly which one of the three instruments in our expected growth forecasting uh, model that is pulling most of the weight. It turns out it's the operating cash flow COP. Okay. After we construct a factor on COP alone, operating cash flow alone, and the alpha strength reduces jobs from 67 to 37. Okay. It's the most. Um, most 
most the biggest reduction. Well, as if we simply throw in Tobin skill, it's like alpha doesn't really change, which means Tobin skill doesn't do a whole lot. And the changing ROE as well, it does a little bit more than Tobin skill, but still uh, 63 basis points per month. Bottom line is that our expected growth factor is mostly operating cash flow factor. Spending tests in a prior video presentation, um, the which factors paper 2019 review of finance. So we reported the factor spending tests in the sample from January 67 to December 2016. So on these two slides, this and next, we extend the key results um, two more years to December 2018. Uh, the results are uh, fairly re um, robust. So look at the investment factor. So that's our investment factor on average return and premium and T value and the pharma French six factor model and alternative six factor model with cash based operating profitability factor cannot explain our investment factor. Okay. Um, so because their CMA is based on two way source with size, whereas our investment factor is based on triple source with ROE controlled for. And that gives us a little bit more juice in generating factor premium. Our ROE factor is 55 basis points. So again, the two versions of Pharma French six factor model cannot capture our ROE factor premium. And with uh, 20, 27, 23 basis points per month and big T values, our expected growth factor uh, is even more so as survives the six factor model with 71 basis points per month and uh, uh, and 64 basis points per month, big T values, even after uh, cash-based operating uh, um, uh, profitability factor, okay? In terms of uh, GIS test, the pharma French models are rejected by the GIS test, okay? Now let's turn the table around to use the Q and Q5 model, models to explain the pharma French factors. So UMD is momentum. So the Q factor model can explain momentum. That's re being reported repeatedly and the Q5 model as well, right? CMA is basically zero in the Q factor model uh, because our investment factor is stronger than, than their CMA factor. RMW has a zero alphas in our setup as well. So Q factor model, and uh, right, so, and in particular, the, our ROE factor has a bigger loading and sufficient to reduce um, W alpha to three basis points. And finally, the, um, our Q5 alpha is delivers minus one basis point for RMW. RMWC, which is the cash-based operating profitability factor that they have, the Q factor model cannot explain that, which leaves behind 24 basis points per month, but the Q5 model is able to do that. Uh, 11 basis points per month and T value 1.8. And in terms of GIS test, so this is the Gibbons, Ross and Schenken uh, te F test that all the pharma French factors earn zero alpha in our model. Um, the GIS test cannot reject the Q5 model with RMW, RMWC, you see the p-value 9%, 11%. So uh, uh, neither is significant. All right, so that's our expected growth factor. Next, we're gonna be using the Q5 model in a large scale empirical horse race. So our playing field, we have eight competing factor models, Q factor model and Q5 model, and Pharma French 5, 6, and alternative six factor model with RMWC and Stenbaum Yuan four factor model, Barilis, Barilis and Schenken six factor model. Uh, they use our uh, two Q factors, investment ROE factor, uh, but they also adding uh, Asnif Frizzini monthly form the HML as well as momentum. And finally, and Daniel Hirschleifer and Sung uh, three factor model. So as noted in our prior work, 2019 at Review of Finance, uh, both Stenbaum Yuan model and Daniel Hirschleifer and Sung model deviate from the more standard the factor construction approach uh, following Pharma French 1993. For example, they tend to use uh, 20, 60, 20 breakpoints when sorting on a sorting variable, whereas we follow Pharma French in using 
30, 40, 30. Okay, so we replicated the uh, factors using the more standard approach. We find that um, uh, their non-traditional factor construction inflates their explanatory power. So to ensure we compare apples with apples, we're going to be using replicated, uh, their replicated factors as opposed to their original factors. So sharp ratios. Um, so our expected growth factor is 44. Uh, percent monthly sharp ratio and in terms of maximum sharp ratio that can be uh, achieved uh, with several factors that are risky okay and risky in the sense that volatility is not zero so i want to uh, stay away from the risk versus mispricing debate uh, because as we have written elsewhere we do not think a risk model is the only way to look at uh, rational expectations or efficient markets uh, paradigm, because in our view, as noted a bit earlier, in, even in this presentation, um, both consumption betas and the firm level variables are both sufficient statistics for explaining expe uh, for 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 determining expected returns. So, but the bottom line is that our factors that do not have zero standard deviations. Okay, they come with some volatility and you can combine them together to, to, to generate the maximum sharp ratio. It turns out our Q5 has a 0.63. It's, you know, so um, it is high. It is higher than uh, Barilas and Schenken and as well as a uh, pharma French six spectrum model. All right, so in terms of uh, left-hand side variable, we look at the 150 anomalies uh, that we compiled in our replicating anomalies paper, NYC breakpoints and evaluated returns. So across six categories, um, momentum, value versus growth, investment, profitability, intangibles, and trading frictions. Um, so we started out with 452. Uh, we ended up with 150 uh, that are significant at the single test at 5% level. There's been recently a lot of discussion on replication crisis in the literature, uh, which I will not get into in this presentation. So 39 momentum anomalies. This is the detailed list. Um, you know, Jack and Dish and Tidman, um, post earnings announcement drift, and the cumulative abnormal returns around the earnings announcement. This is the, uh, the key variable in uh, Daniel Hirschland for instance. Uh, P the factor, post earnings uh, announcement drift, drift factor. Um, we also included the more recent, like the residual momentum, for example, and segmented momentum, and value versus growth. Um, <laughs> so only 15 left uh, in our replicating anomalies, uh, which ends the sample in 2016. There are 29 significant value versus growth variables. We extend the sample by two years. Uh, there are only 15 left uh, in a recent release, the latest release early this year. Uh, of Q factors that the library and this number drops further. Okay, so the value premium is taking a hit uh, in, in, in recent uh, five years or so, and probably longer, especially uh, 2020 was a pretty bad year for the value premium. So, um, all right, so standard variables and book to market sales to price and net payout yield, the cash flow to price. And the investment, we have 26, investment to assets and different versions of uh, equity issues, stock issues, composite issues, and different versions of accruals, which can be, uh, may be interpreted as working capital investment, uh, inventory changes, for example, operating accruals, Richard's famous work and as well as Richardson, Sloan, Solomon Tuna's uh, total accruals and different components of it, of, of, uh, of total accruals, discretionary accruals. Um, it's very nice paper, which I love um, tremendously by Shear 2001 accounting review on discretionary accruals, as well as percent accruals. Uh, 40 profitability variables, ROE, ROA, um, gross profits and the and Rayborn co-authors um, operating profitability, cash-based operating profitability, which and this is the variable that is underlying that plays a key role in our 
expected growth factor. So we, our work is inspired by their work. So, so uh, let me give credit what the credit is due. Intangibles, we have organizational capital R&D, the market, um, advertisement, and then um, Heston Satka's seasonality variables. Uh, they are very reliable. We replicate them more and none of the factor models can do anything about this seasonality anomalies. So, so, so I'm, 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 I'm really uh, fond of the, I really like their work, Heston Satka. So that's really, really solid, uh, incredible piece of empirical work. So trading frictions, only three variables left, okay? So we started, we started 106. So that was a big point the made in our replicating anomalies paper. 106 uh, trading frictions variables, only three are left standing. All right, so um, let's look at overview of our uh, empirical horse race. We're looking at relative performance of factor models, okay? That, let me explain the table setup. The first column is the average magnitude of high minus low alphas across all 150 in this panel. So the second column is the number of significant alphas, absolute T value higher than the single test 5% hurdle. The third column is uh, passing the Kim um, and uh, Harvey and co-authors um, critical T value cutoff of three as an informal uh, multiple test adjustment, okay? is much higher than the traditional single test hurdle. And this alpha bar is the mean absolute alpha across a given set of deciles, not just high minus low, not high minus low. Okay, so this is across deciles, low two, three, all the way to nine high. And the last column is the number of GIS rejections, okay? Out of 150 sets of anomalies, how many sets of anomalies you can use GIS test based on this testing asset, based on a given test of assets, you can reject a given factor model, right? So GIS test says that the null hypothesis is that uh, the 10 alphas for a given set of testing portfolios are jointly zero. So it's not just a high mass law. Right, so let's first compare the first column, the first row and second row, Q and the Q5 model. We see that the Q5 model improves on the Q factor model substantially. The high minus low alpha magnitude drops from 28 to 19 base points per month. Significant number of anomalies, 52 to 23. Um, multiple tests, significant anomalies with multiple tests adjustment 25 to six, not a whole lot of improvement on mean absolute alpha, but in terms of uh, number of GIS rejections, uh, we jump from 101 to 57. So bottom line is that the Q5 model improves on the Q factor model substantially. And then uh, let's compare with our uh, main competitor, which is the Pharma French six factor model. We see that the Q5 model seems to be outperforming the Pharma French six factor model, 19 versus 30, 23 versus 74, six versus 37, um, 10 versus 11 is basically a draw, uh, but the number of GIS rejections, 57 versus 91. I should mention, although not emphasized uh, in, their, in their six factor paper, their cash-based IMW actually performs better uh, in their six factor model. And you, know, uh, you can see 30, 27, uh, 74, 59, 37, 25, and 91, 71. But bottom line is that even compared with the, the alternative six factor model, our Q5 model uh, still looks uh, um, better. Um, so a few other words about the alternative models. Um, Barillas and Schenker model actually doesn't do too well especially out of 150 anomalies, their model can be rejected by 132 uh, times using GIS test. The reason is that they have monthly formed HML along with the UMD in their lineup. As a result, um, then because HML, monthly formed HML and the UMD are highly negatively correlated. So as a result, they were having all kinds of trouble in explaining uh, 
annually form the value versus growth anomalies. The details are in the paper, and uh, I'll, I will, I'll leave you to, mm, to read the paper for details. And that's what I'm going to say about that. And DHS model, I mean, of course, we're using the replicated version. And, uh, and, um, um, and we do see that, so in terms of significant anomalies, they have 70. And 37 in terms of alpha magnitude is actually uh, lower than the pharma French six factor model as well as the Q5. Category by category, look at, let's look at the momentum category and we outperformed the pharma French six factor model. Okay, you can see it right here, uh, four versus 19. Okay, and keep in mind the pharma French six factor model has UMD in there and we have RE factor and expected growth factor. So uh, we, we perform uh, we outperform their six factor model. Value versus growth, uh, we underperform slightly by the alpha magnitude, 23 versus 19. Uh, we do, and as well as magnitude of alpha, and 13 versus 10. But in terms of number of significant high minus low alpha, we are one fewer. And number of GIS rejections, we have two fewer, seven versus nine. So we say, uh, you know, you can see we underperform a little bit, but not by a whole lot. Um, investment anomaly, we do quite a bit better, 10 versus 23 basis points per month. Um, average magnitude of high minus low alpha, one versus 10, right? So this is a big difference, zero versus six for multiple testing and the six versus 16 for number of GIS rejections. This is investment. Profitability, we do pretty well also, 14 versus 31 basis points, five versus 26, one versus 13, and 14 versus 25 in terms of GIS rejections. Intangibles, uh, roughly, um, uh, we, 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 we do better, but not by as much as in the investment and profitability category, 13 versus 48, 8 versus 13, 13 versus 18. Trading frictions, there are only three left standing in this category, so everybody kind of roughly comparable. Um, so the next set of tests we are performing, instead of uh, one by one anomaly, we form composite score decibels, all right? Composite score means that we take equal weights. By equal weights, I mean we take the simple average of a stock's percentile rankings across all 150 anomaly variables. And then we, this way, we, it's a simple aggregation scheme of all 150 anomaly variables. And then we calculate the one high minus low. We calculate deciles in particular, look at high minus low. In other words, this is a composite score that summarizes all the anomalies that we have. So we see that the average return is 1.7% per month is enormous. And nevertheless, of course, this is a little bit of an in sample thing, uh, but nevertheless, it does pose a high hurdle uh, for factor models to explain even in sample. And T value is 9.6. The Q5 model shrinks the high minus low alpha 1.7% per month to 0.37. However, still significant, but the economic magnitude 0 0.37 versus 1.7 is a big reduction. However, the model is still rejected by the GIS test and relative to pharma French six factor model, our alpha Q5 alpha is 37 basis points and pharma French six factor alpha is 94%, 94, 0.94% um, per month or 94 basis points per month. So the Q5 model outperforms the pharma French six factor model. So we're gonna use the similar test design on each categories of anomalies. So momentum anomaly oh, across 39, we have 1.1% per month. So the Q5 model actually turns it negative, alpha negative, insignificant, and GIS test cannot reject our model. Whereas pharma French six factor model leaves behind 33 basis points per month alpha, um, slightly significant, and although that model is not rejected either by GIS test. Value versus growth, we underperformed the pharma French six factor model. Let's be very clear about that. The, across 16 value versus growth anomalies, the average premium is 70 basis points. 
the farmer friend six factor model only has 19 left, insignificant, whereas we have 38. But our Q factor model in this case does slightly better. But nevertheless, the farmer French five factor model actually shrinks it all the way to zero virtually uh, because the five factor model has CMA and HML, uh, in a sense, two value factors. Uh, whereas farmer French six added the UMD, and because we have expected growth and and, and ROE factors, the Q5 model is not doing as well. But so investments uh, across 26 variables, uh, 66 basis points per month. The Q5 model does pretty well, only six basis points for our alpha, insignificant. GIS test cannot reject our model, whilst the Pharma French six factor model has 27 basis points and the big T value. Uh, 2.8 is not low. Profitability as well, 80 basis points, that average return, we shrink it to minus 14 basis points, insignificant. Whereas Pharma French 6 alpha, 6 factor alpha, is 43 basis points per month with the T value close to 4. Intangibles were roughly comparable, 50 versus 54. Okay, both models are rejected. Trading frictions, there are only three left, so roughly comparable, okay? Um, we are slightly worse, but not by a whole lot. Uh, the T values are insignificant anyway. All right, so, um, so finally, I'm gonna present a few prominent anomalies and how the Q5 model manages to explain it. So post earnings announcement drift, this earnings momentum, the Q and Q5 model both explain it, okay? But the Pharma French 6 cannot with the T value and 2.23. And uh, this is a Jack Edition Tittman price momentum and uh, uh, all models explain it, including Pharma French 6. OA is Richard Sloan's extremely influential article at Accounting Review. 1996, uh, operating accrual, uh, we had a big problem uh, in the Q factor model. So the average high minus low return is only 29 basis points, but we are generating 57 basis points for our alpha. Okay, and once we throw in the expected growth factor, it kind of go away, mostly goes away. So alpha Q5 alpha chops to 20 basis points and insignificant. Whereas the Pharma French six factor model continues to have trouble explaining operating accrual. And uh, even with the alternative RMWC and the alpha is still significant. What's even more conspicuous is the CS 2001 discretionary accrual. The premium is 45 basis points. The Q factor model blows it up drastically to 74 basis points per month and Q5 model helps it Substantially, albeit still significant, we're looking at 31 basis points, but the pharma French models have continued to have big problems. So, and this is discretionary accrual is quite intriguing. Um, uh, quite intriguing. I started out in my 2010 JAR article, Journal Accounting Research. I started out, I was thinking accrual anomaly is basically uh, working capital investment. So I get to use investment factor to explain accrual anomaly, uh, right? So that plays some role for operating accruals, but not discretionary accrual. The reason is that in Shear's estimation of discretionary accrual, he was using the modified Jones model that uh, he was regressing the total uh, operating accruals on sales growth as well as PPE and take the residual as discretionary accrual, right? And the PBE component or change in PBE component, that's a big chunk of investment factor right there. So in other words, even after controlling for the investment component, the accrual still forecast returns quite strongly, right? And then subsequently, and the, going from 2010 to 2015, we come up with the uh, ROE factor, right? And that makes the accrual anomaly worse because accruals enter earnings as well, well, bad quality earnings, right? So accruals 
come across as part of earnings and our ROE factor is confused. Uh, right, our factor will say, right, this high accrual firms are earn higher rates of returns, but in the data, accruals goes, accrual forecast returns in the opposite way. So that's why the Q factor model is actually exacerbates, exacerbates makes the accrual anomaly worse, right? And finally, once we manage to put the expected growth factor together, uh, which accounts for a cash flow, basically uh, fixing the level of earnings, higher accruals mean uh, imply lower cash flows, which means lower expected growth, right? And finally, we are able to kind of um, mitigate the problem and if not fixing the problem completely, and our Q5 alpha is only 31 basis points per month. So bottom line is that most of the other anomalies are riding on one dimension or another in our Q5 setup. Either there are different manifestations of investment anomaly or factor or different manifestations of the ROE or profitability um, factor, uh, but accruals, accrual anomaly is the only anomaly that simultaneously writes, writing on all three of our uh, Q and Q5 factors investment. So discretion, <laughs> discretionary accrual, accrual anomaly is it's simultaneously part of the investment factor, part of earnings factor and a part of expected growth factor. So accrual is really, really fascinating. The final example is R&D to market. This is, a, uh, this is a standard case for accounting conservatism. So R&D to market, high minus low 73 basis points per month, fairly reliable. Uh, Q factor model just cannot do anything and makes it slightly worse. Again, R&D is expensed away uh, because intangible capital doesn't meet the conservative accounting definition of assets because future payoff is too uncertain. Okay, so high R&D, you are expensed away and makes your earnings, accounting earnings su uh, sufficiently low and that's gonna, that's gonna uh, confuse our ROE factor big time. In, in, in fact, ROE factor is gonna load the wrong way. Uh, however, once we put the uh, cash flow back in the picture, so, and the uh, cash flow is gonna capture uh, some of the better measure the intangible investments, including R&D and our expected growth factor is gonna say, all right, if a company has a more R&D expense, it means that oil has been equal, the company is gonna have higher uh, uh, expected growth going forward. And because of that economic mechanism, the Q5 alpha is only 27 basis points per month, way smaller than 81 basis points and it's insignificant. Whereas as the pharma French uh, models, six factor models, two versions of it continue to have trouble explaining R&D to market. All right, so uh, let me conclude. So in this paper, we show that the Q5 model outperforms the pharma French six factor model in a large scale empirical horse race. In particular, we highlight the importance of the of our new expected growth factor, especially in the presence of uh, intangible economy uh, in which uh, intangible investments are becoming more and more important, our expected growth factor and captures intangible investment factor. Thank you.